sir, for being here. It is my pleasure. Thank you. Oh, man. Well, I'll tell you, you and your father have built such a monumental you know, work. I guess you could call it a ministry. Mm -hmm. But you just begin to unpack things. People don't know about our Constitution, about history, about America. Right. And one of the questions I just kind of want to get into with you is, where are we and where do you see us heading? And that is a very loaded question. I know it right? is. I know. <laughs> and, you know, there's a balance, too, because we I definitely consider there's a ministry. Uh, and as a faith guy, you know, I remember the Old Testament. You, you make a prophecy, you get it wrong. Oh, right. It's, it's that, so I'm not I'm not a prophet. But historically speaking, if we look back historically, it's it's super fascinating for a couple of reasons. Our nation is more divided now probably than any time uh, that we've seen in our history, uh, c comparable with like the Civil War. Civil War, a little more divided. Yeah. But I mean, you can kind of see like we might be in the build up to that kind of it's division. Coming. And what's also equally fascinating about it, th there's a very positive aspect in the midst of it as well. Because I also see it's just like the, the divide in America, 1830s, 1840s, every single major church denomination in America split over the issue of slavery which is super interesting yeah, it is. Uh, because all of them are saying, hey, we love God, we love Jesus, but we disagree on this issue. <laughs> well, I mean, you, right, you really have churches today that are confusing things that should not be confusing in Scripture, whether it be gender and you know, male and female. Like, it, it, it's kind of interesting in culture, but why it's interesting historically is because the 1830s and 40s was the middle okay. of the Second Great Awakening. Come on. Come on. In the middle of the Second Great Awakening, every church denomination splits in America. Oh, wow. Ha, ha, how does this come together? And, and it's even interesting because you can track a similar thought from the First Great Awakening. In the First and Second Great Awakening, we so often think of awakenings as a unifying time in American history. And Fascinating, Tim. Come on. Awakenings are times when truth and morality was being debated in culture. Yeah. And an awakening would be maybe more properly understood as a clarifying time in culture. A clarifying time. Right? It wasn't unifying. It was clarifying. And it, it, it made it very clear what side you're going to be on. Yeah. Are you going to be on the side of truth and God's word? Yeah. Right? Truth and morality? Or are you going to be on the other side? Well, Charles Finney, the, the probably most noted individual from the Second Great Awakening, he founded Oberlin College, which was a Bible college. It's not today anymore, but at the time it was a Bible college. It's, it's believed that under his ministry, there was one year alone when the estimates were more than 100,000 people came to Christ under his ministry. So God is moving. Like oh, crazy man. things are happening. Yeah. Incredible. He founds his Bible college. At the Bible college, he required that every student in the Bible college be active participants in the Underground Railroad. Is that right? So come on. They're getting directly engaged in culture over some significant cultural issues. Yeah. And he's like, if you won't be a part of this, you can't be my Bible college, which is a crazy thought. But also, I mean, you look at the Second Great Awakening, it's, it's not this really wonderful, lovely time, no. but it was a clarifying time. I think we are living in a clarifying time when unquestionably God is on the move. It's unquestionable. Right? Yes. And, and, and this is why I would argue, I think we're in another awakening, but First Great Awakening lasted 30 to 40 years. Second Great Awakening lasted 60 to 70 years. And they were only called awakenings historically looking back. And they were called awakenings because you saw a, a shift in culture. Yes. Well, we, we have not accomplished a shift in culture yet. But I would say things like Roe versus Wade being overturned. Oh, my goodness. 2020. We're, we're, we're starting to see. Yeah. We're starting to see a shift. We're going to see more religious liberty than we've ever seen before now. Similar. Go back to the Second Great Awakening. As there was progress being made in areas... There was a devil who did not like progress, and there was a lot of problems in other areas. So th th this is not to imply that there's not going to be challenges and battles. And historically, I, this is not my prophecy for <laughs> the future, but historically it's fascinating yeah. that the first Great Awakening finishes, the next major thing that happens, the American Revolution. Yep. Second Great Awakening finishes, next major thing that happens, war. Oh my goodness. But part of what happened is in the time of clarity, enough Christians gained not just enough understanding of truth, but enough backbone that they said, we're standing up for truth and we're not letting this happen anymore. My goodness. Well, I believe 2020 
was a catalyst for that. Yes. And here we are again. Now we're in 24 and we're, we're moving forward. You know, it's interesting. I believe the church has been given choices, opportunities, and you see this division between people that say, hey, church should have nothing to do with politics. And yet you see some people standing up for politics. Even a really popular speaker recently came out and denounced that, that uh, pastors should do anything politically. Right. But here's what I want to say. What do you think about that? What should we do about that? So historically, again, I get, I'm going to use historic examples, although I could say a lot in, in my current Bible thoughts. Of course. Yeah, of course. Historically, it's really fascinating. There was a a professor at Duke University. She was a historian back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Her name was Alice Baldwin. Mm. She wrote a book called The New England Clergy and the American Revolution. And she was tracking the role the pastors played in the early revolution. And one of the things she identified in her book is if you look at the Declaration of Independence, every, every issue in the Declaration she identified had been preached from American pulpits prior to 1763, oh. which was more than a dozen years before the Declaration of Independence. And what she points out is when the founding fathers came together and they were discussing their ideas, yes, it wasn't their ideas they were discussing. It was what they had learned from their pastors. And, and here's where a lot of people don't make the direct connection they should. The pastor's voice should be the most influential voice in a Christian's life. I mean, Jesus, yes. right? No, no. Obviously Jesus, <laughs> right? But Jesus speaking to the pastor, right. oh, the Spirit can speak to us. Not to discredit that. Yes. Right. Our quiet time, most important. But the, the, the Bible talks about there being a shepherd. That's right. Right? And the shepherd's supposed to watch over the sheep and protect the sheep. And if a wolf comes, the shepherd puts himself in front of the sheep. That's right. And in the founding era, the pastor saw a wolf coming and they said, we're going to stand in front of the sheep. And this is also really interesting in modern culture, in my perspective is Jesus clarified in John 10, there was only one difference between the shepherd and the hireling. Uh huh. The hireling saw the wolf and said, I don't want any trouble, I'm out. That's right. Right? The shepherd positioned themselves to defend the flock from the wolf. And the reason that, to me, this is very telling, is anybody paying attention will know that there's a wolf coming for our kids right now. Oh, it's true. Right? It's the pervert mafia. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And so any pastor who's not willing to stand up between mm -hmm. the sheep and the wolf, yeah, then I don't know what to tell you other than Jesus said that makes you a hireling, not a shepherd. I think that's a great point. You know, the movie The Patriot, Mel Gibson, right? And there's that scene where the church pastor steps out and he gets his musket and he gets his armaments. And he's like, well, sometimes you got to run off. I think he said wolves. You got to yes. stand against this yes. thing that's coming up. And I believe that's what pastors need to do today. Not like we're getting our pitchforks and torches and storming the castle, but we got to begin to to ward off this nasty right. spirit that's coming at our kids. It, it, it really is. It's something that pastors have bought into the lie for so long. Well, let's only, let's only talk about Jesus. And I'm saying the lie for so long because Jesus did not say only talk about Jesus. <laughs> what a statement. Jesus did not say only talk about Jesus. I, I mean, right? Yeah. Jesus told the disciples, if you love me, keep my commands. How can the church keep his commands if we've never talked about his commands? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I mean, let's, let's, let's start unfolding this a little bit. And, and this is where Jesus said also, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Yes. He didn't say, go make converts and tell them about me. That's right. He said, make disciples. He did say make disciples. And a disciple knows how to take their faith and live it out, whether they're in business, whether they're in education, Come right? whether they're in law school, medical, like it doesn't matter. You take your faith with you where you go. Come on, Tim. But we are so in this world today that what Jesus is for the church, no, Jesus is for the world. He is. I call that a complete gospel. You're just, you're so good at what you're articulating. I, the gospel we hear preached is correct, but it's not complete till it's going through us right. and influencing everything around us. Right. And I'll tell you, uh, your insights to this are so profound. So we're in the culture right now. We're here in, you know, the season we're in. We see all this crazy stuff going on politically. They're persecuting the former president. Where do you think this is going to land? Do you think that there's a, a path for him to come out of this? I, I do. And one of the things that, that we know is the devil often overplays his hands. He does. Right? Yeah. I, I, I mean, the reason he got kicked out of heaven was his pride. Well, pride goes before the fall. All right, what the Bible tells us. Yes. So, yeah, pride is not the best thing for you to be identified by and known by. <laughs> but no. what we know is that pendulums often swing. And it, it can only go so far before it's coming back. And I think we're, what we're seeing right now is there are so many people who are recognizing 
the sham of the process. That's right. They're, they're seeing a man persecuted that even some of them who, who didn't like, right? When, when you have people like an Elon Musk yeah. or Joe Rogan who I are know. saying this thing is rigged, again, like against it's happening. Right. Like when even they're saying it, yeah. that is pretty clear. You're even actress saying, you know what? He's on the table. I, I'm going to vote for him. <laughs> right. Wild. And, and so you're seeing him gain in the African-American community and the minority community in general. Uh, so I, I think there's a very real chance and opportunity for the pendulum to swing back. Now, with that being said, I, I also recognize that if you do not believe in God or you are Machiavellian enough and you think that the end is just by the means and all that matters to you winning election, there are people out there that all they care about is winning the election, so they don't care if they have to cheat to do it. That's right. Right? Yeah. And, and there was an interesting study that came out from the Heartland Institute that they called uh, several thousand individuals who had done mail-in ballots, and they just asked them some general questions. Are you willing to talk? Okay, can you tell me about this? And, and they identified... Of the people they talked to, 20% self-incriminated, self-identified that they had done it illegally. Well, I filled out for my parents because I, I knew they were going to be too busy. So I filled it out and sent it in for them. Well, I did it for my grandparents. I did it for my friends. And like, really? oh, that's illegal. Well, that, they said 20% of the people they talked to identified they did it illegally. Well, 20% of mail-in ballots, that, that's the election. It's that's, done. That's yeah, Right? It's over. Game changer. With that being said... There, there obviously are people who are going to try to do things to help their side win that are going to do illegal things. But the other thing that I think is, is positive is the, the last presidential election cycle, people, people weren't ready to stand up and say no to cheating. Uh -huh. Right? Right. Because we were kind of just watching going, they're not supposed to do That's that. That's not right. Right. Back to my games. <laughs> right? And now people are like, no. Yeah. No. Right? Well, no. We, we realize that a man that sat in his basement, that everyone on the campaign trail, <laughs> right, to have the most votes in America. The candidate, the, the right. star master. Yeah. Right. The, yeah. the guy who, who, when the DOD finds him guilty of a crime, it says he's not cognizant enough to stand trial, but he's okay to be president. Like, bad guy? The nuke codes, yeah. Right. Yeah, come on. But I, I think now there's a lot more people paying attention. And this is what I'd even encourage people, is that we actually can have people in all 50 states that can actually sign up to be uh, poll watchers, that can be uh, election judges. You guys uh, offer this? Well, this is something that every state's different. Okay. But they can sign up in their county, uh -huh. and actually you can call your local party, hey, I want to sign up to, to help volunteer Oh, that's amazing. And, and they can help oversee some of this. The other thing I would say is because there's people that think, well, cheating happens, sometimes their concern is, why should they even vote then? Yeah. And the reality is that what I like to remind people is when, when Jesus taught parables and, and like Matthew 25, Luke 19, taught the parable of the mind is the talents. At the very end, when the master came and rewarded the servants, we think of it, and well, he rewarded those that were productive. Well, they were the productive ones, but he didn't say, well done, good and productive. No, he, he, he said, well done, good and faithful. That's right. We've been called to faithfully do the right thing. Yeah. Whether it works in our favor or not. In America, we've been given a stewardship yeah. of our nation. Oh, man. And our vote is part of how we walk in obedience with our stewardship. Yes. So whether you think it's rigged or not, you as a Christian, it. you got to be faithful to do the right thing. Tim, thank you. That, that is such a good perspective and such great insight. Um, this book. You, you wrote yeah. this recently? Is this my, your newest? My, my dad and I just finished this one's called The American Story, Building the Republic. Uh, it goes to the first seven presidents, and it actually shows what a good leader looks like. What kind of <laughs> president should we have? Oh, man. And actually, some of them, what not to do when you're president. What not to do. But it's, it's a really great story going through the first seven presidents, learning who they were and what they did. The American Story, Building the Republic, and where can they get this? Wallbuilders.com. Wallbuilders.com. Tim, I'm so grateful to have you on this broadcast. I'd love to have you again sometime. Would love it. For your input, sir. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. I want to say a very special thank you to our partners. Whether you've been a partner with us from the very beginning or if you've recently become part of our partner family, we simply want to say thank you. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you because it means so much that you're standing with us. We're accomplishing a lot together. And I'll tell you, if you're interested in becoming part of our partner family, I'd encourage you to go to josephz.com or text the keyword GIVE to 719-259-0029.
you know, we want to welcome you to the family and we will be calling you. If you become a partner, we call you regularly and we love talking to you. Our team calls you. It's not a call center. It's our team. We love our partners. I hope you'll consider it. I hope you're praying about it. And I hope you become a part of our partner family today. Have you noticed the collision of good and evil, light versus darkness? It's happening every day right in front of us. I'm Joseph Z, and I just wrote this book, Breaking Hell's Economy. It's a prophetic book dealing with this exact issue. What we're facing right now is a collision of kingdoms. It's the kingdom of darkness versus God's kingdom. It's the kingdom of light versus the gates of hell. And what you're seeing is this collision taking place, but we are promised that the church, the called out ones, would overcome and we would never be taken over by the gates of hell. In the times we're living in, you can see incredible, outstanding breakthrough in every area of your life. Much like the children of Israel that went through the darkness and shined as a light in Goshen in the middle of difficulty. This book is a prophetic book for you and your family to thrive in the middle of difficult times. You know, there's nothing new under the sun, and that's what we're seeing over and over again is this challenge. You've seen the Great Depression back in the 20s and 30s. You've seen wars and world wars and many things that have come against society, and this pattern repeats itself. And I'm here to tell you today, even Jesus dealt with the same issue that we're facing today when he was a child. Many people have been through this before, and the outcome determines what you believe. What you believe and what you know will bring a great outcome for you. And this book is a prophetic book that will help you navigate and break out of this present evil age. Get ready to be the light in darkness. Get ready to be the light in Goshen that God has called you to be. Breaking Hell's Economy is for you. I encourage you to order your copy today.